Hello, wrestling fans, and welcome back to another edition of NBC's 10 Count. I'm C Fall, but on today's edition, I'm back. Oh, wow. sorry. I don't want to keep singing. I'll keep doing it. I'm better than ever. I'm with Eric Bischoff. Eric, how are you doing today? Well, I, I was doing really well till I heard you sing my oh. interest music. And no, I think you did a great job. <laughs> you sing it so you sing it so well. I'm embarrassed that I can't. Oh, I sing that song all the time. No matter what I'm doing with my kids, I don't know why the I'm back part always when I come home from work, I walk in the door and I you, I belt it out. <laughs> I'm back. They have no idea what I'm doing, but I know what I'm doing. And, I'm, and so thank you for allowing me to give my children memories of me singing a song. They'll never know what it actually probably is. Well, so, and let's say and let's say check out Peacock. Unless they check out Peacock, we can check out all the good material of Eric Bischoff, WCW, WWE, all there for your pleasure. But today we're talking about your new book. Now, mm -hmm. grateful, this is coming out November 11, 2022. And mm -hmm. why was now the time for you to make another book? Um, I don't know if it was so much about the time as it is about what I've discovered. Uh, about myself and how much more I appreciate the last 30 or 35 years of my life in, in the wrestling business as a result of what I've learned. I mean, I just changed the way I look at so many things now and that, that different perspective has just opened up the door to so many other great things. And the book is really about that journey. You know, the, the stories I heard along the way, you know, cause I thought my rest, you know, I've thought my wrestling career was over a couple of times over the past 30 or 35 years. And, and in, in reality, it was, you know, when I left WWE, we, when, when WCW, you know, was eventually sold to WWE, I thought, okay, that's it. That's it, man. Wrestling's in my rear view mirror. I wasn't happy about it, but it was it. Move on, reinvent yourself. Time to do something else. No choice. Boom. And I did. And, and I did so quite successfully. And, and, and then I got, you know, called into work back in the wrestling business with WWE as a talent. And I got pulled back in again. And then when that was over in 2005 or six, or whenever it was, I thought, okay, this is it, man. And I was good with it. I was happy. You know, I ended my career on a high note. You know, I put a period at the end of the sentence the way I wanted to. I got to write that last sentence, you know, as a performer and it was all good. And then, boom, I got pulled back again with TNA. <laughs> and then once that was done, I thought, okay, that's it. Never again, never again. Oh, hey, Bruce, how are you? Vince <laughs> wants to see me in his office? Oh, shit, here we go again. 2019, now I'm back again. And what did I learn along the way? And, and, and I talk a lot about that in the book. But it was, it was after leaving, you know, WWE and 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 kind of learning how to really appreciate the opportunities that I've had that has just changed my outlook. Now, obviously when you're in the wrestling bubble, like obviously when you are in charge of WCW and in WWE and TNA, you're in the bubble. So obviously right. it's, the grind is there every day you're doing this. Once you're out of the bubble, it seems that now you can appreciate all the things you were doing because at the time you're clawing and scrapping your way to get the pieces you want. Now you're like, Oh, well I did all that work, but now I can look back on it and go, I did that. Is that how you yeah, feel? It, it, I mean, that's part of it. You know, that, that, and I think that's a natural kind of evolution for, for anybody. In my case, it was a little different because my, you know, my return and my exit again and my return again and my exit again, not all of them, you know, the WWE was a very good, positive, you know, experience. But along the way, the last 15 years, man, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur all my life. It's the reason why I got into the wrestling business in the first place is because I was an entrepreneur and a good salesman. That's just been, it's my DNA. And, you know, entrepreneurs live a pretty much of a roller, co roller coaster financial life. And I've made millions of dollars in the wrestling business. Not that big a deal. You know, probably didn't make a fraction of what a lot of people have made in the business, but you know, I've done well. But being an entrepreneur, I've taken a lot of chances. I've, I've, I've taken some big risks, financial risks, and some of them have paid off really well. Some of them have not. <laughs> and over the past 15 years, as I'm bouncing off the bottom, never really hit rock bottom, at least not long enough to say I'm there, but bounced off it enough to know what it feels like, right, financially and in every other way. And I, the, the book really starts off with uh, a story about me being in one of those 
you know, bouncing off the bottom kind of moments, being frustrated with myself. You know, I'm 60 years old. I got to reinvent myself. That's not easy to do at 60, especially in this industry. And I, I was financially forced to go to an independent wrestling show. I didn't want to go. I had no desire to go back and relive those memories and try to pretend, you know, and be on. And I just, uh, I just gritted my teeth, but I had to go. I needed the money. That's the truth. And I got there with kind of a crappy attitude mm. and not at, not at anybody else, at myself, right? And, and I saw, all of a sudden, I walked backstage and I saw and felt, mostly felt, an energy that was so positive. And it reminded me of the way I felt back in 1987 when it was the, one of the first times I was in a locker room and somebody that I had seen on television but never knew, you know, walked into the room. And when I walked into the backstage area of this independent wrestling event, I was just taken aback by the energy and the positive feeling of it. And it changed the way I looked at making those personal appearances. Even though I still had to do them financially, I started going to them and having more of an open mind. Yeah. And all of a sudden, because I'm more positive about it and maybe just more open-minded and could see more, I'm listening to people tell me stories about how wrestling and the Monday Night Wars brought them closer together with their brothers or their fathers or their uncles or their sons. And you hear these stories and you go, you know, I'm, I'm just chasing the money. I'm, I'm trying to be a big deal in the wrestling business. I want to be number one. I mean, me, me, you know, ego. Oh, it, it's not a bad thing. I don't, I'm not embarrassed by it. It's what we all strive for, right? We all want to be as successful as we can be. <laughs> but in the process of being as successful as I could be, and as you put it, clawing and being in the bubble and just the grind of it all, you don't realize the positive impact that you can have on people. Mm. Or do you do have on people and you never know about it. You don't really, you don't realize it because you're just looking at your own stuff. You know, you're looking at your own goals, your own, you know, meeting next day, you know, with the financial committee, you know, you're just caught up in the crap of it all. And as I started going to more and more of these events and hearing these stories, I heard one that just, I, I, I was at a comic con in, in Scotts or in Phoenix, Arizona on stage with Hulk Hogan and Sting. I was the moderator. This young lady told me a story and I just, it started to make me cry. And a couple of weeks later, she reached out. That young lady reached out to my wife. She was able to track my wife down and fast forward. I'm walking her down the aisle at her wedding because her and her father used to watch Monday Nitro every Monday night. It was the only father-daughter time they ever had. Wow. Really was that. That was their bonding. That was their father-daughter moment of the week. And he he passed away and her, her mother had passed away. She didn't have any other family. And she reached out to me to walk her down the aisle at her wedding. And that, that's, that was like the tipping point for me. That, that really made me go, okay, I, I need to take a different perspective on life because it's way cooler than I thought it was. And I learned all that over the last 15 years as it relates to the last 15 years of my wrestling career. Wow. You That's got... why it's time to share something that it's not, it's a wrestling book. You're going to hear about wrestling. Yeah. We're going to talk about WWE and TNA. And, you know, when I was there back in, in 2019 and I lasted for four months or whatever it was, we're going to talk about all that. But I'm also going to talk a lot about how it's affected me and, and changed my life for the better times 10. Wow. Yeah, the connections that you just brought up between the, the audience and yourself, clearly the bonding of a daughter and a father watching Nitro and the Monday Night Wars. It, it, I think a lot of people, I, I, a lot of people have so many stories of the connections between wrestling, their personal life, and the characters they see on TV. And obviously, you know, this person was able to reach out to you and your wife, and, and now the connection is more than just a TV character that – was playing a bad guy on TV. You have connected emotionally in their hearts. And I think that's a, what a lot of people feel about you in general with their life, because you, you are going to, you're, you are always going to hear how great you are from people, obviously because of who you are and what you've done. But when someone shares that personal story with you, that connection, I think that 
that, 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 that the means end. everything. That means yeah. everything. The rest of it is polite and it's excitement and it's it, it's being a you know a fan that wants to engage and yeah. and all of that. But when you hear and and I hear every time I go to an event now because I I make a point now. I don't just sit there and sign autographs. I look people in the eye and I ask questions. I want to know. I want to know. And this is not. I'm not about me. I want to know how wrestling changed their lives and their, wow. their relationships. And I hear it all the time. I can't go to a signing now and, and not hear a really interesting heartwarming story three or four times a day. So it's, and it's not just me, it's, it's the wrestling business and wrestlers. I think the, the, the talent in the wrestling industry are different than the talent in TV and movies. Oh, 100%. For whatever weird reason, I think, Fans of wrestling feel like they know the talent on a much different level than they feel like, you know, they know they don't know Tom Cruise. Right. Well, he's only done so many movies. Wrestling is every Monday, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, But if you see John Cena on the street, you feel like you know John Cena. You've spent so much time with John Cena, you think you know what he likes for breakfast. (laughs) You know, what? how he likes his chicken cooked. You know what I mean? You just feel like you know him. Yes. And Uh, that's a dynamic that's so interesting. You did bring up personal stories, and uh, I'll, I'll share one of mine. As a child, when someone would ask me, did you watch WCW Nitro? And I'd be like, they're hurting my WWF. Why would I watch them? And I was like, you know, 10 years old. Like, the NWO is hurting DX and Goldberg and Steve Austin. So I had my personal connection was I did not. I was so angry as a 10-year-old <laughs> when I saw someone wearing an NWO shirt because I'm like, they're hurting. But then, of course, later on, you eventually watch, and you're like, oh, this is this is, this is much better than what I was forcing down my throat so yeah what uh, and once you hit 30 you begin to actually appreciate it i did i i did i definitely went back and watched every nitro and uh they it's 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 a great watch on peacock if you're interested but your stories though these stories are obviously so personal and guy evans who wrote the uh, the rise and fall of wcw he is someone there, there's his book right there and there's your book right there controversy creates cash i noticed that right off the bat brother well come on, you gotta <laughs> um i i own these i've read them they're not like uh they're not fake they're real <laughs> no it's it, this is a fake background though no, but honestly the stories that you're sharing with guy evans what allowed you to trust him with your your stories you wanted to share with the rest of the world it's a really really great question because that's an important important part of the equation um i I met Guy after the book came out, the Nitro book came out. And, I, you know, I read the book, and I was so impressed with the integrity that Guy brought to his project. The fact that he researched or, or did interviews with over 120 people, many of them, many of them executives at a much higher level than I was, some of those executives I never even had a chance to meet. So, and to me, that that spoke to his integrity as a as a journalist and as a writer. And I got to sections of that book that was less than flattering, as as far as how I was represented. But I respected the fact that he included that material in a balanced, respectful way. So I had integ- I had a, a sense of Guy's integrity before I ever knew what he looked like. And then after I was on a panel with him talking about the book a year and a half, two years ago, whatever it was. And then we just clicked. You know, you just you meet somebody and you talk for a few minutes and you can just I can just tell right away whether it's somebody I want to talk to again or not. Yeah. And I just felt like, man, this is a very interesting cat. And I I trusted him right off the bat. He he's he passed the uh the trust test immediately because of the work that he put into his book. So yeah. when a guy was the one to call me, he said, Hey, what do you think about another book? I said, what will we talk about? He said, well, I follow you on social media. I hear a lot about the things that you say and the way you say those things. And I think there's a different Eric Bischoff out there than, than most people really realize. And I think the book talking about that would be interesting. We started talking about that and did a couple of interviews and I went, wow, this this could actually be kind of interesting. And if nothing else, I had fun doing it. Yeah. 
that, that again, the perspective that people have of you, I think, over the past 25 years is completely different from the perspective they've gained over the past few years with your podcast coming out with Conrad Thompson, 83 weeks, because the narrative online, you know, Easy E and ATM, Eric, all these stories you hear about. And Tony, like, Tony Khan now has the ATM, Eric. Title. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I talked to him yesterday. So he, he, uh, he that, that ATM, Eric thing has gone long. It, time it ago. is. But that, look, that man is spending more money than Ted Turner would have ever allowed me to spend. <laughs> the, the perspective though, I think has changed. And I think this book will definitely give that more, um, weight to it because of so many times of reason, reading the wrestling observer in like 1999, you're reading terrible things about you. And so, when you would see negative articles about yourself then and even now, how do you feel about that? Because clearly the people don't have all the facts because they're not going to you, the source of the information. Well, you've, you've got to realize guys like Dave Meltzer, the Wrestling Observer, Brian Alvarez, his little stooge, um, they're, they're wrestling fans. They're fanboys. They're fanboys with a newsletter. That's all they are. They're not journalists. They don't treat things uh, like I Evans did <coughs> with integrity. They don't imp- approach their writing with integrity. They're very, very emotionally rather unsophisticated people who react emotionally and are more than anything driven to frame what they write and say in a way that reflects their personal f- opinions. Thank God they're not judges. You know, mm-hmm. thank, thank God they're not teachers. You know, thank God they're not really in charge of anything because if they were, their personal feelings, emotionally stunted as they may be, would kind of prevail over any other, it would prevail over any subjectivity. So, uh, and I know that, you know, unfortunately readers don't, the internet doesn't, but, you know, I just laugh, you know, when Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez, you know, do their evil Eric Eric's out of touch. That's her latest one. He's out of touch. He's so old. He's out of touch. Um, forgetting the fact that I probably produced more television for more networks over the past 15 years than anybody they know um, that was in the wrestling business, especially. But whatever. I, I just laugh it off. It, right. I, I, it is I, what I, it is. I, but I do take the time to point out that they're social, they're social misfits. There's there's longing in their lives that they cannot find a way to fill other than being wrestling commentators. So God bless them. The the so I brought that up because the previous the the book uh, Rise and Fall of WCW with Guy Evans, that book actually gave you the perspective from every angle of pretty much it seemed like people were working against WCW. And I think and that that's was, what uh, people uh, forget uh, about. Uh, well, uh, well, and they don't know because the people up until Guy Evans, the people that covered wrestling that wrote about WCW were douchebags like Brian Alvarez, you know, and 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 people of his ilk, and 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 Dave Meltzer obviously a big contributor to that. Nobody ever really did the work, and that's the part, you know. If I resent anybody for anything, it's like don't be lazy. If you're going to write about me or anybody else. You know, do the work, at least have the respect for yourself and for the people that read your work to do the work and don't take the cheap, emotionally stunted, you know, high school way out because you just don't like your bishop. So I'm going to write mean things about it. That's really what it is. It's like freaking mean tweets called journalism. No, that's um, not the best way to look at things, uh, unfortunately. But with, but with Guy Evans, though, what was one of the topics that was most difficult to talk about? Because obviously, over the past few years, you've gone through a lot of ups and downs. So sharing a story that's so personal to you, what was the most difficult story to share that you can at least give me a tidbit so you're not spoiling the book? Um, I think being – here's the fun part. And, like, I get an opportunity right now in this interview to exercise – what I've learned is so valuable that I talk about in the book. That's just being honest with yourself. Everybody thinks, I used to think, oh, I'm being honest with myself. If I say to you, you know, Steve, I, I, I think you're kind of a jackass. Yeah. Well, that 
that first of all, that's not true. But by way I, of example, if I were to, if I were to if you were to say something to me that you know half half offended me, yeah. I said, well, Steve, I think you're a jackass. Deep down in my my mind, I'm thinking, well, I'm being honest. I'm saying what I'm thinking. Therefore, that's honest. No, that's not being honest. Asking myself why I feel like you're a jackass for saying what you said is honest. Yeah. And then really thinking about that. Why do I react to the things I do? And, and be very honest with yourself about that. And that's the fun part of this journey that I'm on. And when you ask that question, um, I think that in this book, you know, I didn't want to talk about the fact that I had to file Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2017. I really didn't. It was out there because, of, you know, guys like Dave Meltzer are like, hey, you can't run a business in WCW. You file. Well, I, I filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which is a corporate bankruptcy, not a personal one. Right. Uh, because I invested a massive amount of my own money into a new venture that had every, every right, we had every right to believe was going to be a successful one. We had high quality people involved, did the work, blah, 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 blah. But the market changed and I lost a fortune. And it was like, okay, I've got to, because I'm a risk taker. I'm an entrepreneur. That's what we do. We lose seven times or eight times out of 10, but those two or three times we win, we win big. That's just the nature of the game. It's like yeah. being a professional gambler in a way. Um, and I took the risk. I knew it was a risk going in. I knew I was too old to be taking that risk and to be taking all of the money and all the assets that I had and putting all of it up against this idea. But I believed in it. So I did. And I, and it didn't work. So psh, I'm filing chapter 11. I'm, I'm 60 years old, 60 years old. And I'm filing for chapter 11. I didn't want to talk about that. Right. But, but I'm now worth, I have a net worth in the seven figures. I'm all good. I paid off every one of my debts, 100%. Nice. Um, that is in my rear view mirror. I reinvented myself at 60 years old. And in really less than three years, I've paid off all of my debts and am now, like I said, have a net worth in the seven figures. Wow. More than seven figures. Well, there you so go. I, you know, yeah, that, but, but, but here's the, here's the thing: being honest about it yeah. and being honest about how I got there. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. I want to let's just pretend that part didn't happen. Let's just talk about the good stuff. Yeah. No, you got because that that doesn't that's not honest. And I think it's the honesty and looking for things to be positive about that allowed me to pay off all those debts and to end up in a seven figure net worth again and, you know, be debt free and all that. Had I been wallowing in the muck that I would have been wallowing in 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, I'd still be in it. And I'm not. And I, and, and being honest about that is I think cathartic. Wow. That's a, that's a journey and a half. Uh, but here you are, you know, doing well for yourself, obviously. Um, but what do you want readers to take away from your brand new book that comes out on November 11th, because you've, you talked about so many things already connections with people, business opportunities that didn't go well, but then you took a gamble and it all worked out. So what is the message you want people to take from reading your new book? Learn discipline yourself to start your day, recognizing what you have to be grateful for. And that's sometimes I, it wasn't easy for me. You know, when I filed for chapter 11, I mean, I thought this is, I was, it was a bad time for me, but, but fortunately I've got a great wife and she reminded me every day, I've got a tattooed on my wrist. that says grateful. You, we all have, whether it's your health, whether it's the fact that you just, you get to see another sunrise. Cause a lot of people don't, Yeah, a lot of people I know don't. A lot of people I've been close to for years can't anymore. We all have something to be grateful for. But once you start recognizing it as insignificant as it may feel in the moment, but then you look at it differently, all of a sudden you'll start realizing other things that you have to be grateful for. And the more grateful you are, the more positive you are. And the more positive you are, the more likely it is you're going to come out of your crap. That's what worked for me. I was going to say, uh, usually people say, are you on the happy bus or the angry bus? And I'd rather be on the happy bus uh, <laughs> in life. You know, and I, here's the thing. It sounds so simple, 
I mean, we, we've all read those books, right? Yeah. We've all read those books. We've all seen those bumper stickers. We've all heard those conversations. And it seems so simple, but, man, when you're down, things are going against you. When, when you're emotionally getting your butt kicked, it's not as easy as it sounds. But once you master that art and you start off every day that way, again, I'll speak for myself. I'm not yeah. trying to tell other people what to do i'm just what i learned and you'll read about it in the book is just waking up every day and being grateful changes everything yeah that's kind of like the next question of vince mcmahon stepping down as running the wwe and the creative and ceo there's a shake up there and, and this is something i don't think anyone saw everyone expected vince mcmahon like die in the chair writing a storyline but here he is gone so what does this mean you think for the wrestling business in general I mean, I think once we're all, it's funny. I just got done talking to Hulk Hogan right before I jumped on. That's why I was late for our original. Oh, wow. I, I have emailed him. He has not responded. So uh. <laughs> I, I, I actually said, oh, but your email came or your text came while I was on the phone. I said, oh, my God, I'm sorry, man. I got to call you back. I, I was supposed to be on an interview seven minutes ago. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we were talking about this first time I talked to, to Hulk in, a, in probably a week or two. And um, look, it's if. It's going to be strange for people like us, all of us who have been fans, those of us who have been in the business and have worked with fans and been, you know, in my case, competed against him, worked for him, covered the gamut. Uh, it's just weird because he's been there forever, right? And right. he's like the only head coach the team's ever had right. since the team was born for most of us. Right, most of so us. So it's going to be weird, but I think it's going to be better, you know, and – Look, Vince did amazing things. He, he, anybody that doesn't give him credit, a lot of it, and respect, not only credit, but respect for what he's accomplished business-wise. Let's separate his personal proclivities to business and what he built. Anybody that doesn't respect what he built is just juvenile, childlike. Um, but I think with... New management. I, you know, look, I'll, I'll talk about this briefly, but when I was there in 2019, I worked side by side with Vince McMahon on a pretty regular basis. Sent in way too many meetings with Vince McMahon that I even want to think about. I get PTSD like <laughs> symptoms when I do. But as amazing as what Vince built is and how he went about it, his personal way of going about creative is his system, his creative system and approach doesn't work for anybody, but him. Yeah. It just doesn't, you know, and he's well-documented, you know, working 20 hours a day, you know, at two o'clock in the morning meetings, by the way, true. And there had to do it. It doesn't work well for a team that you're relying on. Mm. And I think with triple H in there now, because triple H has been in that spot before he knows he knows how tough it was to work with Vince because of Vince's system. And because he knows, I think we're going to see a new creative system in place over the next few months. I think that new system is going to allow some extremely talented writers that I know are still there. I work, I get a chance to meet with them and work with them a little bit for a few months. Incredibly talented people. Guys like Ed Kosky, who's been there since the early, you know, 20 some years, incredible talent, a lot of great talent there in a writing team that are going to be able to kind of emerge in this new environment. And I think you're going to see a lot better product as a result. The rest of the company, you know, one of the other things that I think anybody that, that is honest about Vince has to acknowledge and respect is that he built the the public company that is now WWE is a blue chip public company. There are seasoned executives that are highly credentialed. Their their bios, their their history, their success, their resumes are off the charts good in every major part of the country co company. Whether it's the CFOs, Nick Khan. Stephanie could not be a better person to be in the position she's in. It's a very solid company that will survive the former CEO. And I think not only survive it, surpass it. And the stock market reflected that. 
Stock market is up 10%. Everybody on Friday, all the Dave Meltzer's in the world, oh my God, he made the announcement after the market closed because yeah. he knows the market's going to crash. Not only is this piece of garbage trying to pretend he knows what's going on in the wrestling business and the television business, which yeah. is laughable. Now he's a stock market analyst. <laughs> and what did the stock market do? It went, huh, it went up. this is gone. Okay, I'm in. Come on. Yeah, I know that that is very interesting when you see stories like that, because I don't think people can people who cover sometimes wrestling don't realize, you know, people always say wrestling business, but they always bring up wrestling first. It's like, you know, we're, we're making money here and they and, don't know anything about the business side of it. None of them have ever been involved in it. That's you, true can't, too. you can speculate about things. You can have an opinion about things, but you don't know your, your, your rear end from a bag of rocks. <laughs> When it comes to the business side of things, you're just guessing and speculating. And in, you know, and in the case of a lot of people, based on their personal feelings and emotions, right? That's that's yes. what it's all about. Yes, this person needs to be pushed. Well, is that going to make them money? Like, like you need to think about that part of it. They're all like, "Oh, this person deserves it." Why do they deserve it, though? Yeah, like, deserve deserve well, for what reason? It's an interesting word, deserve, like, isn't it? it? It's a personal opinion when you say deserve. Like, I deserve this. Well, why do you deserve this? Because I think I deserve this. Well, that's not a – that. show me on a pie chart where that's going to make us money because yep. that doesn't work for me. That's real life. But in the but in the wrestling dirt sheet universe, it's way – you know, if, if you're the dirt sheet booker of the year and the dirt sheet – writer that gives you the dirt sheet booker of the year award thinks you're doing a great job. You're going to do more of what the dirt sheet booker thinks is good, but it's not working. No, you know, um, it's just not. No. Uh, one question that has nothing to do with current events, but I always, I think you've answered this before, but I, it's just one of those perspectives. I'm always like, so you, ch you've always been asked this before you, you challenged Vince McMahon to a fight uh -huh. back at slam And yet he didn't show up, but he's a coward. <laughs> I, he was smart because he's like, well, if I show up, they're buy right. You know, everyone's going to buy the replay and see this happening. Uh, and I would have kicked his ass. He would have kicked he, his ass. He would have. He would have not only put money in my checking account. He would have gotten his ass kicked in front of millions of people in the process. That's a bad proposition. Yes, Lo losing, giving someone else money, and getting your butt kicked. It, you know, it doesn't sound too good for a man of his ego. I imagine. Uh, that's always something I always wanted to see happen of Vince McMahon, Eric Bischoff at the time, you know, when you work for the company, uh, obviously, look, it's going to be different. Vince McMahon spent all of his time in a gym. He's throwing around a bunch of weight, getting all pumped up and thinking he's a tough guy. I was a bouncer in a bar in downtown Chicago, Russian division. One of the, at the time, pretty fun place back in the eighties. I was a bouncer. I'm 170 pounds on a Friday or Saturday night. I probably had four to six fights with guys that were twice, but not twice my size, but good 230, 240, 250 yeah. jacked up, muscled up guys walking around with their, their polo shirts on two sizes, too small, kind of bumped around, showing around in the bar, trying to get laid. I fought all those guys. They're easy. They blow up after, but you stay away from them for just long enough. And you just watch their face start to explode. <laughs> and they're so easy to hit because they don't really know how to fight. Right. They know how to look good in the gym. You get some, you get the right color tights on them, the right t-shirt, you know, the right, the right picture, maybe some, maybe some sweatbands under back in the eighties. It was all about the headband. The headband made you look good, man. You, but you get those guys out of the gym and on the street corner. <laughs> come on now. All Thank right. You. So clearly, if Slambury that match, if that fight happened, it would have. But did you really? Did you think he was going to show up at all, or no? Yeah, no, I did. I was told by everybody that no, no, I didn't know Vince, but everybody that I knew that did know him said, "Dude, he's coming, man. He's going to kill you. He's going to be enraged. He's going to want to get his hands around your <laughs> neck and choke the life out of you. Reach inside oh, your geez. chest and he." Eviscerate you. <laughs> he would probably. Went, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, a first, I'm, I'm a black belt in martial arts. I wrestled in high school and college. I'm not afraid of it. He's going to kill you. Yes. But he didn't show up. I and didn't show up. Here's the part. I couldn't show up because it was my daughter Stephanie's graduation. Oh, come on, please. I Yeah, I'm going to say, because I've heard stories of people missing birthdays, weddings, Christmas, Thanksgiving, every holiday there is because of wrestling. And you're telling me the guy who tells you you can't skip things 
wasn't going to skip something to come beat up Eric Bischoff or try to. Come on now. And, and I know he wanted to, you know, what's really funny and I'm having fun with this, by the way, but I, what's really funny is I talked to guys like Jerry Briscoe and Bruce Pritchard and he wanted to go. He wanted to show up. He was talked out of it, but he wanted to go and, and, you know, common sense prevailed from a business perspective. Right. But, uh, you no, know, to answer seriously now, I'm not, not having fun. I was convinced he was going to show up, show up. And I made arrangements for him too. I didn't think he was going to show up like at 10 in the morning and go check out catering. <laughs> but I figured, you know, at some point during the day, right before the pay-per-view or not, he's going to show up. Okay. And I made sure that my security, I had, a, I had a dressing room for him, stocked, catered. Wow. Right? I had security. I uh, had directions on exactly what to do if he showed up and how to get him to the ring when the timer was right. Because that is true. The perspective of if he showed up, well, you're, he's in the, in the enemy's locker room. There's everyone there might have worked for him before or hate him now. So like th- that could have gone sideways. No, man. But obviously, but obviously in, you if, – you If he would have walked in that safe. locker room, half that locker room would have been, you know, sucking up to him because it's like, hey, man, if I get fired from here, I want to be able to go over there. Oh, God. Hey, Vince, you – man, your biceps are looking good, <laughs> Vince. You're going to kill Bischoff. <laughs> is, that, is that Jessica Inferno saying that to Vince? <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at those, Vince, those quads. Oh, oh my God. Those God. quads. May I touch them? Can I, can I just touch them? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, you're musk. Uh, I can smell you from here. You should be a Yankee candle. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, I didn't even really think about the, the, the schematics of it all. If he does show up, okay, well, what's he going to sit outside and wait? And then, and then go, like, in the, in the parking lot with, like, a chain and no, cars we, surrounding we had a, we, we had a dressing room for him, catered. Wow. Uh, we, and, and security knew they, I had certain people assigned to take care of Vince McMahon and his team. Should they arrive? That's what their job was that day. They didn't have any other jobs that day. Just that job. Well, it's an easy day for those security guards. I guess. Yeah. Really easy. They just mowing down on Vince McMahon food waiting in the, the room. Yeah. After, after he got counted out, my hand got raised in, in, in victory because Vince McMahon didn't have the ball. <laughs> to show up oh, no. um all those guys that i was assigned to to from security to watch fence or take care of events they were just all eating the food that i put in his office for catering yeah, so an easy day down i was gonna say you got paid to not really work because it was not he wasn't there but to eat vince mcmahon's food man yeah. i gotta find these security guys i gotta get them on the show and talk to them like well how good was the catering that day yep it was good Oh, that's crazy because again that, that's one of those stories of like if that happened obviously you're you know you would still be talking about it today being like man that time you knocked out Vince McMahon like it would be in every buddy's topic of conversation the top 10 things the craziest things that's ever happened in wrestling the two owners fighting that'd be like um I guess now uh like Stephanie McMahon and maybe Tony Khan fighting or Nick Khan oh my Nick god Khan. Stephanie McMahon would kill Tony Khan Really? Are you? Oh, come on! I'm just you, curious. What, what, have you, you have you, you know, stood lo- next to Tony Khan? I have actually. I'm, I think I'm person? taller than him. Yes. I met. I met. I was gonna say. I, I met him uh, a few days ago um, at a media scrum. So I, I did meet him there. But yes, Stephanie McMahon. I've seen in the distance, and I guess she is bigger than Tony Khan is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Stronger, so, bigger, and hey, I've been slapped by Stephanie McMahon. Yeah. On television, which is supposed to be what they call a working slap. Mm. She don't know how to work, at least not a slap. I mean, that girl could hurt you. She would kill Tony Khan. Kill him. Yeah, set that up. Somebody book that. That'll be fun. I, I'll I pay think, to see that. I was going to say, the I'll next pay-per-view is, some, is Stephanie in, in the weight room, punching, the, you know, just like you were in the kicks and... I think we just reenact scene by scene, shot by shot. See, that would be fun. Look, everybody steals ideas from everybody else. That's a that's an idea that's ripe for the picking right now. Just go ahead and take it. Obviously, Repackage it, make it feel new. People make, love it. Some people who have who, who just started watching wrestling won't know that happened twenty something years ago, so they'll think that's it's right. brand new. Um, but obviously, if Stephanie can beat up Tony Khan, then you believe Triple H can beat up Tony Khan. Oh my God. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the other thing. I, for a second, I thought you were about to say Tony could beat up Triple H, but if your perspective is Triple H is going to 
beat up Tony, Tony. couldn't beat up anything. No? Tony Khan couldn't beat up anything. Oh, my God. And, oh, my God. This is, no, this is a silly conversation. <laughs> it this is, is like talking about my wife beating up somebody. She's, a, she's 98 pounds and couldn't hurt a fly. Has, she, has your wife beaten you up before? Mentally. Yes. <laughs> I don't Mentally, she's about 260 and shredded. Oh, my God. Yes, I have, a, I have a wife. I have two kids, a third on the way. I am definitely afraid of my wife when I – it's like, did you pick up the shoes in the room? Oh, my God, the shoes! <laughs> so I have definitely been there. But um, Eric Bischoff, your book, November 11, 2022, Grateful. This is going to be a great showing of more stories because Controversy Create Cash has so much meat on the bone. It's a Conrad Thompson line that I love when he says. Um, I gave him that line, by the way. He stole that line from me. You gave it to him? And he stole I it? gave him that line. I use, I've use. i been using that term for the last 20 years. And all of a sudden, now I'm hearing it coming back to me. Okay, cool. I remember that. You don't, but I do. Good. Oh. You know what's cool about this book, though? <clears throat> Grateful? I want to make sure I get this in because sometimes I forget. This book, I believe... I believe could be a collector's item. Wow. Why? And I'll tell you why. Not like not Gutenberg Bible collector, right? Not that level, but eh, eh, in there because for the very first time, to my knowledge, there's going to be a QR code at the end of every chapter. And that QR code is going to take you to an exclusive interview that you cannot see anywhere else with someone who is a subject within that chapter to hear their perspective. Is this ever been done before? This is publishing history. Again, not Gutenberg Bible stuff, but wow, pretty freaking cool. So pre-order, if you pre-order now, what comes out in November, not only will your book be autographed, but you'll have a piece of what could be one of the most collectible books of all time, save the Gutenberg Bible. Bishopbook.com. Wow. wow. I, that right there, technology itself is going to be amazing because I feel like everyone's going to borrow or steal from this idea of... of oh, it, they it, will. It, it's they will, but you've... But look, you guys are hearing it first. Now, somebody may rush. Somebody that's got a book that's going to hit the press here shortly, they may rush out and, and do it because now they're hearing about this. Like, if I was really freaking smart, I wouldn't talk about this. I'd wait till the book comes out. It would be there, and I, I would have planted my flag first, right? Yeah. But no, like an idiot, because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm out here talking about it because I'm schlepping books. But that's to your advantage or to the, the potential reader's advantage because they want to get that book right away. This is the first book with this feature ever announced. I'm 100% sure about that. And therefore, it's, a, it's like it's a collector's item. Get it. Get it. Get it. Folks. Get it. Get it. Oh, my God. That's, this book's going to take over the world, wrestling world in just the world in general because that technology you just brought up, I think everybody is – that's going to be the next – evolution in books because people are like oh i'll just get it on my kindle i'll just get it on you know this now they're gonna want to get it because it's adding extra it's not just getting a book you're getting bonus inside that book which is outstanding yeah. wow well eric bischoff thank you so much for being here on nbc's 10 count i had a great time talking with you today a lifetime dream just achieved but stop hurting my wwf when i was a 10 year old eric okay could you stop that hey, hey, hey and, and how did it end up i went to the wwe I put the E in WWE. true. Come on, man. You, you gave us better. the elimination chamber. Because I have a knack. You know, you... making things better. Oh, right? my God. It's true, folks. Well, Eric Bischoff, thanks again for being here. Folks, I've been Steve Fall. He's Eric Bischoff. Check out his new book, Grateful, with the technology inside it, taking over the wrestling world and the world in general. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.